Hello, this is Phil Goldberg, and uh, welcome to uh, the fourth in a series of four, therefore the last <laughs> Facebook Live that I'm doing from the Hay House page. Today happens to be the official publication date of my new biography of Paramahansa Yogananda, which is our subject today, as it has been. And uh, so it's an auspicious day. You can see the book behind me, and here it is. Officially unveiled, available in bookstores everywhere, and of course, online. Um, for the last several weeks, I've had um, an offer to people who pre-ordered the book to receive a uh, free gift, a 20-minute audio I made that I think will help people get more out of reading the book. It's called The uh, Life Lessons from the Life of Yogananda. Um, so that's no longer available since it's officially publication date. However, have we got a deal for you? I, for those people listening to us live today, um, if you order the book on Amazon today or tomorrow and email me that you have at phil, P H I L, at philipgoldberg.com, philip with one L, or just go to my website, philipgoldberg.com, and email me from there. Uh, confirm that you've ordered the book and request the audio, and I will send you a link. So today, on this auspicious day, I want to uh, tell you some things about the last important period, well, the last period of Yogananda's life. Um, I always think of his life as divided roughly into two parts. His life in India up till age 27, his life after he came to America in 1920 until his passing in 1952 at age 59. And in that second phase, I always think of it as also divided into two parts. The last uh, last week, we spoke about the first part of that, the first years, first 15 years of his time here in the West. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, next phase, the final phase of his life, um, from mid-1935 uh, until his passing. Um, one of the enjoyable episodes of his life to, for me to research and uh, write about was the essentially 16 months, the only extended period of time he spent outside of the United States uh, once he came here. He was sort of summoned to India because the uh, two most important elders in his life, his father and his guru, Sri, Sri Teswar, were both uh, in their early 80s or 80-ish and um, were, if not ailing, his father was ailing, but the sense of time being short and perhaps never seeing them again because he had been away for 15 years and uh, had intended to go back to India at times, but never did. So this was time for him to go. And he did it uh, with uh, two travel companions, two uh, devotees, and they brought with them on the ship from New York to England a automobile with which uh, to to use on their on their journey, and so they spent four months traveling through Europe, uh, which was really interesting to uh, uh, research because um, he writes about some of it in Autobiography of a Yogi, 
But the rest I, I was able to put together from his uh, correspondence and the uh, essays he and one of his travel companions, Richard Wright, uh, sent back to the magazine that his organization published, uh, which is now called Self-Realization, then called something else. And nobody, well, anyway, um, from his travels in Europe, uh, they sailed to Egypt and then from Egypt where he saw the pyramids and all that, and uh, sailed to what was then Bombay and is now Mumbai. And he spent exactly to the day, one year, in his homeland. And um, there were some really interesting and moving moments, some of which, I should say, um, were chronicled in photographs. And so uh, we're fortunate to get um, some of them in the book. So here you have, whoops, yoga, <laughs> there's a mirror image here. Yogananda meeting with Mahatma Gandhi on this trip, and here meeting with uh, the wonderful female saint Ananda Moima. And he writes about both of those uh, meetings in his autobiography, and I filled in gaps. So there's a, so things we didn't know, such as, uh, somebody recorded his conversation with Gandhi, uh, not on a recording device, but took notes, and I was able to include some of that. And this is him uh, with his guru, Sri Teswar, uh, one of the final photographs of him. And by the way, on this page, <laughs> this is him uh, at his workshop, uh, work desk, his writing desk in Encinitas, California, uh, working on his uh, autobiography. We assume he was writing something there. And that's where he spent, uh, where he devoted much of his time to, to the autobiography. But we'll get to that in a minute. His time in India was very moving because um, um, he was a monk. He had renounced the world, but not in the kind of way that uh, one forsakes one's family or any of that. He maintained an avid correspondence with his close relatives. And uh, this was a grand reunion and it's very moving to read about and uh, write about, especially the reunion with his father who, whom he loved very dearly and had been ailing. And he kind of knew this was probably the last time he'd see him. And uh, also the reunion with uh, Sri Yukteswar um, who, you know, he loved dearly and was loved by. And all this was great. And it was really interesting to see uh, Yogananda, who the previous 15 years was um, building his life as a great uh, and important spiritual teacher and gathering disciples for whom he was the guru. And now he was with his guru and... Uh, returning to that humble uh, state of uh, devotional state of being a disciple in those contexts. Um, and it did turn out to be the last time he would see his father. And also Sri Teswar passed while Yogananda was in India. And um, he was not present at that time. And the fact that he wasn't haunted him for a long time, it, it, it disturbed him, and he wrote about that quite honestly. Um, and then, uh, before he left India, one of the most remarkable and memorable chapters in his autobiography, uh, the incident that inspired that, uh, that he describes took place he says <laughs> in his hotel room in, in Mumbai when he, um, when Sri Yukteswar appeared to him and he says in the flesh, calls it a resurrection and tells him things, a uh, remarkable sort of chronicle about the afterlife and all the details of the various astral planes on which disembodied souls 
can inhabit and what they were like. And all this, um, which matches up well with other accounts in the uh, sort of Hindu theologies, um, is a really remarkable uh, chapter of his life and in the autobiography, regardless of what you, whether you believe it was just his imagination or um, he made it up or, you know, he was suffering from some kind of illusion or wishful thinking, this kind of thing, or it was real. Whatever you believe, uh, it's a remarkable account. And I sort of didn't repeat what's in Autobiography of Yogi, but it's part of the story. But it wasn't all uh, nostalgia and sweetness uh, that year in India. He, he worked very hard. He was traveled around a lot. He gave lectures to large numbers of people. He um, taught classes, he trained people to represent him. He solidified the fate of the school he has had established before he ever left India when he and his friends were very young and they established a school in the city of Ranchi and it had fallen under hard economic times for reasons uh, I describe in the book. And he managed to secure its future uh, through some serious fundraising and diplomacy. Um, and all that was part of uh, his mission during the time he was in India to secure the, uh, the future of his organization and property there um, and the uh, ongoing uh, activity of the, the people representing him. And, and his lineage. And um, all that while a very serious court case was raging in Los Angeles in which he was the defendant. And so you see a lot of letters, or I had access to a lot of letters between him and the people in LA and the, boss, the legal team and so forth and him you know, getting news in the you know, pre-internet days, <laughs> uh, pre-cell phone days, when telegrams were the uh, height of technology. And um, this weighed on him heavily. Uh, and and it, it weighed on him not only for legal reasons, but for emotional reasons, because it was the plaintiff in the case was his formerly closest friend and fellow Swami, uh, whom he knew he had known since college and brought to America to help him in, in his work. And they had a split, the falling out, all of which I describe in, in, in the book. But um, it, it not only was deeply disturbing, uh, but um, was the subject of a lot of uh, lurid newspaper headlines in LA and uh, syndicated elsewhere. And uh, the case was settled uh, not in Yogananda's favor, but it was really uh, the first of two serious lawsuits. The next one occurred 10 years later when he was back in, the, in LA. Um, and the plaintiff in that case was the person, another Indian gentleman, who um, was who had taken Swami Dirananda's place. His name was Sri Narod, and they too had a big falling out and a big lawsuit. And this one was even more lurid and sensational than the first. And I, you know, uh, uh, I won't go into the details here, but I I had to address them and some of the speculation. An ongoing uh, debate among certain people about what actually took place and what didn't. So you, you'll get, uh, this is just a preview, folks, of what you'll find in my book. Which And I tried to handle those things with uh, uh, the, not just the delicacy they deserve, but the objectivity and honesty uh, by weighing all the evidence finding out whatever I could about incidents that took place, you know, 70, 80 years ago. 
um, and um, trying to treat them fairly. And I hope I succeeded in that. And uh, when you read those sections, please let me know if I did to your satisfaction. Um, because some of it will never really be known. In any event, um, it was another example, these two lawsuits and the financial difficulties uh, he was facing, not only uh, with his Indian branch of his movement, but back in the US because it was the middle of the Great Depression and things were very, very difficult and very tight. But I quote a letter he wrote to one of his closest devotees um, earlier during his time in the US. And um, it's something uh, I found very inspiring and something uh, that all of us who stand to learn uh, important lessons from uh, an illustrious life like Yogananda's people who are on a spiritual path and who are evolving uh, toward the uh, higher stages of uh, self-realization, to use Yogananda's term, I should always keep in mind, because we have a tendency to think that the lives of highly evolved yogis and what the life we aspire to should be free of difficulties and challenges, but they're not. The real test is not whether you have difficulties, but how you respond to them internally. And uh, Yogananda's uh, story is an example of that. And the, the quote I'm referring to goes like this. He tells his devotees in this letter, a life without trouble and vicissitudes is tasteless, insipid. Troubles come. Let them come. They will be your stepping stones for your upward climb. I think we should all bear that in mind at times when we think, uh, am I not over this stuff? <laughs> Do I still have to deal with this worldly aggravation? Well, you might, but how do you deal with it internally and how do you use those, um, I hope, reading about Yogananda's life will, will be a good example for all of us. In any event, he returned to the US in October of 1936. And there's a little interlude there that was really interesting to uh, research because um, it's not well known, he doesn't write about it, other people didn't either, that um, his ship landed in New York Harbor from England, and um, he was detained. He was detained for three or four days on Ellis Island, you know, the site of great immigration uh, proceedings. And um, people who knew that he was detained have speculated about why that might be the, have been the case. The lawsuit with uh, Dirananda had not fully been settled. And so people have speculated that they detained him until the final settlement was made and legally. And uh, others uh, speculated that he was detained because he had uh, seen Mahatma Gandhi in India and had spoken uh, favorably and enthusiastically about the Indian freedom movement. So the British Empire arranged for his detainment. Uh, those are plausible, but I researched it through the National Archives and their immigration uh, people and experts. Um, and it turns out, thanks to them, um, two things were possible that are almost trivial <laughs> by comparison. One was that he was traveling under two names. He was Swami Yogananda in those days, but he was also, his original name was Mukundalal Ghosh, and so they had records of with two names, and 
one possibility is that they have to sort that out. The other, and the, the explanation the uh, expert I was in touch with favors, is so simple it's ridiculous, that his re-entry visa had expired, which is very plausible because he had extended his trip in India by a few months, and he had uh, he had uh, re um, renewed his his visa, but not quite long enough, and so it would have expired on his way back, and they had to sort that out. In any event, eventually he got back to L.A. and he began a, a new phase of, of his life. Um, he had uh, been wanting to stop the kind of incessant traveling and he was doing all around the U.S. teaching in one city or another and conducting classes and, and uh, working with his closest people to train them to be teachers in, uh, to represent him. And uh, that incessant travel, uh, he had had enough of it. And I've seen this in the lives of other gurus too. You know, they become, they're teachers at first and they gather followers. And then comes a time when they turn over a lot of those activities and administrative work to, to qualified people and uh, stay put more and secure their legacy in other ways. And Yogananda had wanted to do that. And a few, uh, a little while after uh, finally returning, um, he settled down and spent almost all the rest of his life, another uh, 16 years or so, uh, in Southern California mostly in LA, but also in other places. And this was part of securing the future of his legacy for after he was gone. One thing he wanted to do was secure uh, properties and to have permanent locations, ashrams, centers, temples. And that began in earnest in this phase. Um, and especially with the, um, surprise gift he was given when uh, he returned. His uh, closest and uh, devotee disciple, um, a man named James Lynn, was very wealthy and he had been uh, extremely helpful. And writing about their relationship was very interesting and moving as well. And he managed to secure this property on a on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean in the town of Encinitas, north of San Diego, uh, as a retreat center and a place for uh, Yogananda to spend time in quiet, secluded, beautiful location. It's, it's absolutely a stunning place, and it's still the property of Self-Realization Fellowship, and it's You've been to Encinitas and have gone there. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, it's all part of um, why I say Yogananda had the best real estate karma of all the gurus who ever came here. It's a stunning location, as are some of his other uh, properties. And um, if you ever come to Southern California, uh, I would suggest a pilgrimage visit to Encinitas at the center there. And he spent a great deal of time there writing, as that uh, photograph I showed you before suggests, and wrote much of the autobiography of a yogi there. And they also acquired another uh, property, a, a temple on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, which also still exists, is also a beautiful location. And in 1950, they acquired uh, the famous Lake Shrine property, on the other end of Sunset Boulevard, just up the hill from the Pacific Ocean, which is just a, a jewel in the crown of Los Angeles and still exists to this day, and where many people come for a little, as a, you know, to have a little oasis away from the clamor of big city life on this beautiful pond with swans and so forth. So those were acquired in the last years of his life, in, in addition to a property 
uh, out in the desert that d no longer exists, but where he did spend a good deal of time, uh, especially when his health was failing a bit, um, writing in seclusion. And the writing was a huge part of it. The properties were a huge part. Cultivating the consciousness of his closest disciples and the people who would carry on his teachings and administrative work uh, after he was gone uh, was another part of it. He kept teaching. He kept, you know, once a week, sometimes twice a week, would uh, speak on a Sunday morning or a Thursday evening at either L.A. Uh, or um, Encinitas. And, uh, but mostly he was in seclusion, but a very active and busy seclusion. He worked really hard uh, because he felt he, he, had, uh, he wanted to leave behind a written legacy that would uh, capture all that he wanted to say, all that he wanted to leave behind. And in addition to everything he wrote, surrounded by uh, people who would uh, take dict his dictation, uh, edit it, put it uh, typewritten, and then have him rewrite it, you know, in the whole procedure with editors and stenographers and helpers. Um, a, a tremendous amount was written. And a lot of what he spoke was uh, taken down meticulously. And Later, over the course of the subsequent decades after he was gone, um, turned into books. Um, and you can find those online, of course. And uh, I recommend all of them. But he was working on his uh, voluminous um, commentary and translation of the Bhagavad Gita, also writing a great deal about uh, Jesus and all that was assembled in a two-volume massive work called The Second Coming of Christ. But most of all, he worked on what became the autobiography of the yogi, the, you know, the most important uh, component of the legacy that he left behind and probably the main reason um, he remains such an influential teacher to this day that and his other written work and his success in training successors who kept to, kept things going in his app, you know, long after he's, he was gone. And um, all of this, you know, took place over a number of years. And um, some fun facts about the autobiography. <laughs> One, it began Anybody who's read the autobiography of a yogi knows that um, it's an odd book in the sense that there's a lot of autobiography in it, a lot of personal memoir and stories about his life. But really, and, and the main reason I decided there was room in the world for a, a uh, actual biography of Yogananda was he left out a tremendous amount about his life. A large part of the book is about other people he knew and about these incredible yogis whom he either, he either met or had learned about and the stories about their miraculous um, actions, you could say, feats of, you know, mind power and yogic uh, manipulation of energy in the world. Um, and these stories of miracles and wonders are a large part of the appeal of autobiography of the yogi, even though not everybody believes them. There's some people enjoy reading about them just because they're entertainment and others find them very illuminating about what is possible for the for human consciousness, but those are you know a big part of the autobiography. And in fact, he had set out originally to write a book of those stories that would have been called the Yogi Christs of India. And while he was in India, he was busy researching a lot of that. 
as well as researching the life of Lahiri Mahasya, who was his guru's guru, uh, because he was thought he might write a biography of him. And that ended up being part of Autobiography of a Yogi. Over time, the, the project evolved, so it became a sort of combination of the Yogi Christ of India and his own autobiographical story, his own memoir. Um, he also had difficulty getting it published. His primary editor, a woman named Laurie Pratt, um, worked with him assiduously with the whole team, and many drafts were written. And eventually, uh, Ms. Pratt went to New York to uh, find publisher. And it kept getting turned down. A classic publishing story of a uh, iconic book having started out with a history of rejection. Many authors, if you're out there, take heed. <laughs> Save those rejection slips and letters because someday, you know, when you're a successful author, uh, they will make uh, <laughs> for entertaining reading by your heirs or you know, your your fans. Um, and Autobiography of the Yogi was one of those. Uh, they it kept getting turned down. Uh, they got feedback that uh, went into you know some rewrites. But eventually, uh, it was published in 1946, just around in time for Christmas giving in December of 46 by the uh, publisher Philosophical Library. And um, I mean, I actually uh, had a copy of the publishing contract. And uh, well, I don't duplicate the whole contract, of course, in, in the book, but I I do tell you some of the interesting features of the contractual arrangement, which uh, you'll find uh, fascinating, I'm sure, as I did. And um, a few years later, uh, because the book started, be gradually became quite successful, um, he revised it and updated it. And then in 1953, uh, his organization, just the year after he died, obtained the rights. And ever since, um, they have been publishing uh, revisions and updates and all that sort of thing. Another organization, the Ananda uh, Group, uh, publishes the original version of it. And that's a whole, that was subject to legal disputes and all that, but they're out there. And SRF's updates and uh, uh, revised sort of uh, uh, editions uh, have sold millions of copies. And of course, the impact of that book, 72 years after its original publication, uh, remains extraordinary when you think about it. Um, it's it, it, it's been amazing to me the last few years when people ask me uh, what I'm working on, and I tell them. Most people, because you know, I travel <laughs> because of the circles I travel in, know exactly who Yogananda was and have you know read the autobiography and so forth. But many people uh, have, have never heard the name or the name is vaguely familiar, but when I say he wrote a book called Autobiography of the Yogi, they, they say, oh, I heard of that. Or yeah, people have recommended it to me and so forth. And, and that I find fascinating. All these years later, it's not as if we were on the bestseller list last week. Um, but what is also interesting is how influential it was even during Yogananda's life. And he predicted that, he said this book will essentially carry my legacy into the future and it will spread these teachings in ways I could never do, you know, by traveling around and, and speaking to the public. This will spread the word, so to speak. And it did. I, I, in the book, in my book, I, I, I show the growth of his organization 
from 1946 and then, or from earlier in the 40s and then after publication. Um, and that growth can largely be attributed to the fact that people could read that autobiography. Some of his most enduring disciples uh, came to him in the late 40s and early 50s because they read that book from some part of the country and, and traveled to L.A. to be with him. Uh, and it got distributed uh, not only in the U.S. and Canada, but in other places uh, where English could be read. And then translations started to come along. So within years, the number of uh, centers under uh, Self-Realization Fellowship banner uh, had expanded enormously, not only uh, in number, but in, in range, you know, worldwide. And of course now, uh, largely because of the popularity of that book and the efforts of his um, spiritual descendants, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, centers uh, teaching Yogananda's work in his name all around the world. So that book and uh, its influence, and I have excerpts from reviews at the time and my own sort of assessment of the book based on interviews I've done with uh, people who uh, are worth, whose opinions are worth listening to are all in my book. Anyway, the last few years of his life um, were very, uh, especially moving uh, to research and write about because, you know, he was working incessantly and never stopped being concerned about the future, what the future would bring, because he knew, he felt, he did not have much time left. He knew he would not live, you know, a long life, and indeed, he never reached age 60. Um, he was ailing, and somehow, you know, yogis know these things. They're tuned in. And uh, so he, he uh, pressed on to do the, those things I mentioned earlier, secure the future in, in various ways, especially through his writing. Um, and he never stopped being concerned about the financial future of uh, this organization. And... Uh, you can see that in his letters to people of, you know, trying to make sure that the, there's financial security ahead. And he had uh, once said, uh, it's, it, I should add that, you know, he, he was ailing and it was obvious he was to people around him at different times. Um, but I've never gotten, there was never a clear diagnosis and um, just a lot of speculation. But he always said that he, you know, he borrowed a term from uh, the American Wild West that we still use, that he would die with his boots on, meaning, you know, he wasn't going to just slow down and go into seclusion. He was going to keep working until the end. And, um, and he did. And he also said that he would die with his beloved India on his lips. He tried to go back, he planned to go back to India a few times in those last 16 years, but never did. And But he said he would die with India on his lips and, you know, in a, just the sort of final miracle of his life, he did. On uh, March 7th, 1952, he was the keynote speaker at a elegant, reception for the Indian ambassador and the ambassador's wife at the, interestingly enough, at the Hotel Biltmore in downtown LA, which was the first place he stayed when he arrived in LA in 1925. And um, here it was, 27 years later, I guess. Um, no, what am I saying? 32 years later. and. No, 27 years later. Sorry, my math is failing me. 27 years later, 32 years after he arrived in America. And here he was giving the keynote speech, which ends with him reciting a few uh, 
stanzas from a long poem of his called My India, which was this beautiful tribute to his homeland, a love letter to his homeland. And he found that a fitting way to conclude his speech at this uh, banquet for the Indian ambassador. Mind you, this is only five years after India attained its independence, uh, an event that he was extremely happy about and joy uh, celebrated uh, at the time. And um, no sooner did he conclude that a poem, than he collapsed and died, and the cause of death was uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, but interestingly, I had access to the death certificate, and I say in the book that it, it mentions that he had a pre-existing heart condition for 10 years. I don't, it's hard to know the source of that, but the death certificate was signed by one of his close disciples who had been a nurse before uh, becoming a monastic in the, his lineage. So, um, there you have it. We've discussed his life kind of from birth to death, as I do in the book. And of course, um, we uh, couldn't cover everything. So I hope I've whetted your appetite for reading the actual book. Uh, I hope I've entertained you. I hope I've informed you in these uh, four Facebook Lives, um, which are archived, of course, for if you missed any of the first three or anybody you know wants to see them. Um, but now it's uh, time for the book itself. And of course, it's available in all the usual locations, both in usual book form and on Kindle and other e-reader devices. Um, and I hope you find it uh, intriguing enough to order. And if you like it, please uh, leave a review on Amazon. I would be grateful for that. And if you order it today, as I said at the opening, for those tuning in late, um, if you order it today or tomorrow, and send me an email, phil at philipgoldberg.com, or send it through my website. Um, I will send you the uh, audio I, I created as a gift for, for pre-ordering. We'll consider, we'll extend the pre-ordering phase for a day or two. Uh, I'll be happy to do that for those of you tuned into this. And so thank you. Thank you for joining me. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Um, I hope I didn't, I did not see questions up there um, where they usually are. So I hope if you sent them there, that if there was a glitch and I did not uh, see them, I hope um, I either answered your questions inadvertently or you will email me and or put them up on my Facebook page. Thank you for joining me. I hope you like the book. And come see me. I'm going to be in different places in the US in the coming weeks and months. You can get my travel schedule on my website, philipgoldberg.com. And uh, please come to one of the public events and introduce yourself. I'll look forward to, to meeting you. Thank you. Namaste, as Yogananda would have said, and as everybody says in India. <laughs>